Let's go over cardiorespiratory endurance real quick. So we're talking about aerobic training. So if you do any kind of group fitness class, like kickboxing, anything that's continuous, repetitive, interval training, as long as you're not stopping completely and you continue to work out, it's considered aerobic. Continuous and repetitive over five minutes. Some literature will say two minutes. It, really, the at the two-minute mark, the anaerobic system is still helping out a little bit. Just depends on intensity. So, if you do a lot of cardiorespiratory training, the impact on the the cardiovascular system is you'll increase the left ventricle. So the, the muscle that helps pump the blood out of the left ventricle will increase, will grow. It increases your stroke volume. So how much blood can you pump out of the heart? So the more blood you can get out to the tissue, the more efficient you'll be at using oxygen. You'll just have more oxygen available, I should say. And it also increase your cardiac output. And cardiac output is heart rate, times stroke volume and that should make sense because as heart rate increases and if you can increase your stroke volume your cardiac output is going to increase. So how efficient are your lungs? Let's talk about the respiratory system because we're talking about cardiorespiratory endurance. So gas transfer, the uptake of oxygen, how efficient are you at that? And expiration of CO2, how efficient are we getting rid of that CO2 because it gets a lot of gets rid of a lot of acid from the body it's a byproduct we need to expire it and get rid of it and then alveoli are the little fluid filled sacs that this is happening at so there's some capillaries there and that's where we're uptaking the O2 and dumping off the CO2 so let's talk a little bit about the aerobic oxidative energy system we've seen similar explanations of how these energy systems work together. I just wanted to talk about a different chart, but we're still using the same fuel sources, fats, carbs, proteins. Just remember that we're more efficient at breaking down carbohydrate for aerobic exercise. So if you're long sustained bouts of exercise, carbohydrates are our main energy source because especially in the first few minutes, we've got to get energy quick. We run off the immediate source of ATP. Then we start to break down glucose, glycolysis. That's why carbohydrates are so efficient because those carbs are going to be converted to glucose. So we break that down. We do have glycogen stores in the liver and in the muscle. And we can use those as well, but that takes a little bit of time. We normally run off the immediate source of blood sugar our glucose in our bloodstream. So events that last right around two minutes, as long as they're not too intense and we don't fatigue too quick, we'll run off glycolysis, anaerobic glycolysis. We talked about that in the last video. And then eventually that starts to fade out and we do these long sustained bouts of exercise that are greater than two minutes, really greater than five minutes, anywhere in between there. And the aerobic oxidative energy system kicks in, and that's really where it starts to become more aerobic. We start to have to slow down, but we're producing more ATP so we can go for a longer period of time. Now, all of these macronutrients can be converted to energy, but again, like I said before, carbohydrates are the most efficient. So our byproducts of cellular respiration, CO2, that expiring that helps reduce acidity in the body and then the, I should say, H2O, correct that now. And that helps us sweat and cool the body off. So those are all byproducts and we blow off the CO2 so we don't become too acidic and mess up our enzyme function. Just like we talked about in the last slide, pH there's a drop in pH in the body, it can mess up enzymes and they won't function properly. Because those are just proteins, they become denatured. And then you have H2O, that helps cool you down. So we have 
macronutrients as an energy source, which I talked about, but the reason this is important for cardiovascular exercise is you can hit the wall. You use up all your glucose. We're just not very efficient at breaking down fats. And you see this in people that run marathons. They get to a certain point where they hit the wall. And their body starts trying to break down fats, but it takes a little bit more time. And they have to slow down. And they become lethargic. So if you ever hear of somebody hitting the wall, they've used up all their glucose. That's the reason before a marathon or an endurance event, these athletes will carbo load to help make sure they have all the glycogen stored in the muscle and they have plenty of glucose to break down for glycolysis either, but mainly um, aerobic glycolysis. So intensity and fuel sources, there's a fat burning zone and a carbohydrate burning zone. You've probably seen this on machines where it says, oh, you know, this percentage of your calories that you're burning is coming from fat or they tell you to stay in this fat burning zone. What they're talking about is if it's really intense, we have to use glucose for our fuel source to get us going. We're still burning some fat, but for those intense activities, we just don't have enough time to break down the fat. Like if we were walking, and this is just a rough estimate. If we were walking, 75% of my calories may be burned from fat or come from fat that I'm burning and the other 25 from carbohydrate. Whereas if I go out and run, it's just the opposite where 75% of the calories that I'm burning up are coming from carbohydrate and the other 25% from fat. And it varies based on intensity is what I'm getting at. So if you ever see that on a machine, that's what they're talking about. The Atkins diet, we talked about this before, not good if you're doing a lot of aerobic training because it limits carbs and your brain also runs off carbs, so you may feel lethargic. So if you're out training for marathons or long distance events, you don't wanna do anything like a keto diet or Atkins diet, it's not gonna be efficient for you. VO2 max, how efficient are we at using oxygen? That's really what this is talking about. So the average person is 35 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. That's how much they can get out to the tissue. That's average. And then if you're up in the 50s and 60s, you're above average. If you're below 35, you're below average. I mean, that's common sense. And it's going to vary based on age. So as we age, our VO2 will drop, but it doesn't drop as much if you're training. So let's say I'm at 50 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute in my 20s and I continue to train, I'll have a slow, steady decline and maybe I'm still in the low 50s or upper 40s by the time I get in my 60s and 70s. Whereas if I don't do any training at all, maybe I did a little bit of training and then I stopped, I'm gonna have a dramatic drop off. So by the time I get into my 60s and 70s because I haven't been training throughout my life, I might actually drop below average. Whereas when I was training at a young age, before I stopped, I was above average. So you have a dramatic drop off. O2 deficit. Anytime you start doing aerobic training, you're going to create an O2 deficit because you're in that anaerobic training zone to get you going. And before the aerobic system can kick in and supply your ATP needs, you create an O2 deficit. And you'll also have what's called heart rate lag. So you're working out and it feels really intense. It's because of the O2 deficit. The aerobic system hasn't kicked in. It's kind of like getting your second wind. If you've ever heard somebody saying, hey, you know, I have to run for two or three minutes before I get my second wind. That's what they're talking about. You're running off that anaerobic energy source at first. And then the aerobic system kicks in. That's your second wind. That's why it feels easier after that because you've gotten over this O2 deficit. And all heart rate lag is, if you ever hear that, is when you first start working out, it takes a while for um, your heart rate to catch up to how intense the activity is. So um, that is heart rate lag. Anaerobic threshold versus lactate threshold. A lot of people get this confused, and they're not the same. Uh, they may happen around the same time, 
My anaerobic threshold is that point at which the intensity becomes so great, let's say you're training aerobically, but your heart rate gets up there, you start training harder, maybe you're running up a hill, heart rate gets high enough where the aerobic system can't supply enough energy needs and the anaerobic system has to kick back in and help you out. Now, lactate threshold, similar, right? So you're training aerobically, or maybe you're even training anaerobically, and it's that point at which the lactic acid starts to build up in your bloodstream. So it just exponentially increases. You can't buffer it. There's not enough buffer, and it's going to build up. So as you can see, the two are not the same. One is when the anaerobic system kicks in, which could cause lactate threshold to happen where it starts to go up exponentially, but they're not the same. So this one happens, and it may take a little bit, but then eventually the lactic acid builds up too much, and it starts to increase. And normally it's going to happen around, for most people, this is not all, 85% of their maximum heart rate or 75% of uh, VO2 max. So metabolic equivalent, you'll see this on machines. They may give you information in METs. If you want to convert that to VO2, for every one MET is 3.5 mLs per kg per minute. So if you're training at 10 METs, you're going at 35 mLs per kg per minute. That would be average. You know, that's what the average person's VO2 max is. How to two training. This is the reason all of our Olympic, or our Olympic training center is at altitude. Now with technology, we can still do high altitude recovery, but to actually do high altitude training, you need to be above 9,000 feet. What that'll do for you is it increases mitochondria density. Before I talk about this, this is really a misnomer here. Yes, you can train in high altitude or hypoxic conditions, and it will increase these, but most of your performance changes, what you're actually looking for happens during recovery. So you really need to live high, meaning that you sleep at altitude and you train at sea level. That's the best way to train. It's not saying hypoxic training doesn't work, but that's what we found is that works best through research. Exercise physiologists have found that that is the best combination. Recovery at high altitude and training at sea level. And that will help increase mitochondrial density, increase red blood cells, concentration, increase capillary innervation. All of this is getting more oxygen, right? And these two right here are getting more oxygen out to the tissue. And this one's producing more ATP because that's the powerhouse of the cell. Red blood cells have hemoglobin in them, four areas for oxygen to bind. The more red blood cells you have, the more efficient you are or the more oxygen you can get out to the tissues. Mitochondrial density, the powerhouse of the cells. This is where aerobic oxidation takes place within the cell. So the more you have of these, the more ATP you can produce. Interval training. So all of this will help increase your anaerobic threshold, your VO2 max, your buffering capacity, all the things that you would need for endurance training. There are a lot of different methods. There's the fartlek method, which is just go as hard as you can until you can't take it anymore and recover until you feel like you've recovered and just keep repeating that process. There are timed intervals where you go for a certain period of time at your high heart rate, and then you go for a certain period of time at your lower heart rate to recover. And then over time, you lengthen the amount of time you train at the high heart rate, and you shorten the amount of time at the lower heart rate. And then there are distance intervals where I sprint to one telephone pole and then I may walk or jog to the next one. So a lot of different methods. So what that'll do for you is over time, it will improve your recovery heart rate. So if you can train really hard and you get really good at recovering for sport related activities, this is the best way to train. Because that's how most sports are. If you're running up and down a football field, you're not running for a whole 25 minutes, right? If you're playing football, you sprint for a short distance, then you have to recover. You sprint for a short distance, then you have to recover. If you're playing basketball, you sprint down, you recover. You sprint down, you recover. So that's why this type of training, interval training, is best for most sports. Because it improves that recovery time. Muscle pumps. 
Now, you may have heard your coaches tell you, when you're training, don't just stop. And maybe they didn't understand it. But what's happening during a proper cool down, you need to continue to walk around because it activates those muscle pumps. You have huge muscles in the lower body. So, and then you have large veins that are returning blood back to the heart. So if you just stop, you lose the assistance of the muscle pumps. They're no longer squeezing on those veins to force the blood up. And so the heart has to do all the work. And that's the reason some people get lightheaded or start to feel nauseous. It's one of the reasons when they just suddenly stop running. If you continue to, to walk, it'll squeeze on these veins. The blood can only go one direction because there's a series of one-way valves. It lets the blood go up, but it cannot drop back down because the valves stop it. So you need to continue to walk around after you do intense exercise to allow the muscle pumps in your legs to help get the blood back from the lower extremities. Otherwise, what can happen is a lot of the blood will pull in the lower extremities and you don't get enough back to the heart, so therefore you don't get enough back to the brain, you can pass out or get lightheaded. So the skill on your discussion this week or on your video is to set your training zones. So 220 minus your age. So if I'm a 20 year old person, my estimated max is going to be 200. Then I take 200 to find my upper limit, multiply it by 0 0.80%, 80%, and that would give me 160. Then I take that same estimated max, so 200 times 0 0.70, would give me 140. So I know if I'm a 20 year old person that's beginning, I need to set my training zones at 160 and at 140, and then I train between those. And you can set your watches, um, your heart rate monitors, a lot of times it will beep when you get outside the zone. So if you're huffing and puffing, you know, and it starts to beep, you know you're too high. If you're having an easy time and it starts to beep, you know you're training too low. So you, you want to try to stay in between these training zones to maximize all the benefit you can get from your workout. It's not saying that you don't get benefit training too hard, you just can't go long enough. And it's not saying that you don't get any benefit from training lower than that. It's just you're not getting all the benefit that you could get. All right, I will see y'all in the next video.